Welcome to the midweek message from First Grapevine, a United Methodist Church. We're glad you've joined us. Please take a moment and let us know you are watching by registering on our church website or mobile app. We hope this encouraging word will be a blessing for the middle of your week. Hello, welcome to our midweek message. It's June sometime, or maybe if you're watching it in July or August or September, you know, that's when you're watching it. Uh, my name's Carly. I'm a pastor here, and I am joined by Josh and Monica. Josh and Monica, can you kind of tell us what your role is here? You're both on staff. But I'm Monica Lackey. I am the director of families with young children here at the church. I'm Josh Ingram, and right now I am playing the music for the contemporary band. We only have the one service right now, so I'm doing the contemporary music in that service. And before before everything got to the way it is now, when we did our 11 o'clock contemporary service, I led the band through that entire one. What What's it been like since we've been all online the past few months? How has that been with the band and coming up here? Like, what do you do? What's something people might not know? Well, normally we would show up on a... Sunday morning and play through the songs that we had planned to play, lead people in worship, you know, lead people in worship, <laughs> people that we could see, we could know how they were responding, we would know when we should run that chorus one more time, we would know when we needed to take all the instruments out and just hear the congregation sing along, I mean, just all of these things that have to do with serving people when they're present with you. And so the, the, the challenge now is that when we'll come in and, re- and do this recording on a Monday, uh, we have to sort of remember that people are going to be seeing us, that it's not a rehearsal, that we're actually recording this stuff for someone to see live, even though it feels like a rehearsal, because there isn't anyone that's, that's being fed directly by what we're doing. Um, and that also added a little bit, um, a couple of times when I was having to adjust to that, we'd make a a small mistake here or there and I would get so frustrated because we'd have to start back over. Whereas when you're playing it live in front of people, when you make a mistake, it just goes away and you're done. You can't rewind time and fix it. So you just, you ignore it more. Mm -hmm. And um, so there's just been several changes that while they haven't been uh, something that prevents us from being able to lead people in worship and, and spread the good news, it has been something that's caused us to have to adjust the way we do it and, and in so doing, also adjust our expectations of how the day is going to go. I think one of the things I really appreciate appreciate about you and the band in general is that you are sensitive when you're leading an in-person worship service. You're sensitive to how people are feeling and how we would say the Holy Spirit is moving. Uh, and you do adjust. It's never super rigid. There's always room. And I appreciate that. And I will say as weird as it is to worship online, um, one of the things that I have found comfort in is through those worship songs, because even though you're not with us in person, I can still sense, I can still sense it's something that's deeply meaningful. It's not a performance. And so I really appreciate that, but I just wanted to give you a chance to give people a little insight. They can kind of put together Oh, yeah, they come in and record, but it's a little weird. So it's nice to hear a little bit more about that process. Uh, One of the things that we, I thought would be interesting to talk about, you're both parents. Monica, you're a parent of a younger kid. And Josh, you've got some tweens verging on teenagers. uh, (laughs) And school just ended. So what's it been like uh, right now? kind of shifting into summer mode. You've been in quarantine together. <laughs> I don't I don't know if this was your experience, but when when this started, you know, it, it started at spring break. Mm-hmm. So they take spring break, done, and then we start getting alerts that oh, spring break's going to actually be 2 weeks. But they and that's kind of what they were saying. They're like, "We'll just take another spring break." Right. And then it was like, "Well, what We may not actually come back, so this isn't an extended spring break. We're maybe going to try to figure out how to get some. And the teachers and and administrators were scrambling at this point, trying to figure out how to get to all the kids that usually just have to get to them. 
you know? Mm -hmm. Like, usually that's all you have to do is get to the school where the teacher is, and then you've got all the stuff you need. Mm -hmm. um, and so th then they had to figure out how to do all that, and that, that changed several times. But once we finally got that figured out, that was a lot easier. And so it kind of feels to me like, except for a few hiccups early, we've almost been on summer vacation this whole time. Yeah, we feel like that too. We've My son is five. He's hasn't gone to sc real school yet. He did two day a week preschool. But so yeah, we feel like we've been in summer since spring break. And that's like fun. But it's also getting kind of old. Like we're tired of each other. We're kind of tired of being at home. Um, so yeah, it's been an adjustment to go from for him, school is social time. For him, school is friends and, and you know, that kind of thing. So to go from friends and coming up here, if you've ever been up here during the week, you've probably seen baby Robert and he's always doing things and he's friends he's my with everyone. Assistant. Yeah, and he, so he loves that, but he misses that now. So for him, the hardest part, I've, I don't know if I said this last time we were here, but he's an only child, so he's not great at playing by himself. He wants someone to play with someone as in me to play with him all the time and now he doesn't like he a couple weeks ago started playing by himself for hours and I told my husband I was like he's tired of us like he has decided he's done with us he's better off playing by himself than playing with us so it's weird it's just a weird transition it's we have a lot of time and it's kind of a scramble to figure out how do we you know pass the time in a fun way that you know, isn't just video games and TV, but also like some days that's all I have the bandwidth for. So it's a lot of balancing of what do we do? What is enough? What's, you know, what's going to work? So yeah, it can be tricky. And you, you've got, you and the family ministries team has been working on some stuff to help out with that. Do you want to share a little bit about that? Yeah. So we're doing what we're calling the summer of fun at First Grapevine. And we are not able to have our regular VBS. And VBS is a big deal here. We've it's got vacation Bible vaca school. Yeah, right? vacation yeah. Bible school. Um, I, I'm from Texas, so I, you know, I just assume everyone knows what VBS is. But um, yeah, vacation Bible school. And um, we do it really big here. We have hundreds of kids hundreds of volunteers, um, a full week of just crazy, chaotic, fun learning about Jesus. And we can't do that this year. Um, so we've kind of moved it a little bit online. We're trying to keep it pretty laid back and we're trying not to pile on, you know, responsibilities and expectations and things for parents to do because there's already enough of that. Like I have enough expectations. So, um, yeah, we're just doing, we're doing some videos. We're learning about faith and how you can believe in Jesus, even though you've never seen him. Um, and what that kind of looks like, how you get there, how you do that. Um, so it's going to be really fun. We're doing home deliveries with games and fun stuff to do at home and videos of me and Miss Sandy doing weird things and people from the church talking about Bible stories and faith. So, it's going to be fun. I'm excited about it. Yeah. It I'm I've been excited hearing you talk about that. And I'm I don't know. I love vacation Bible school and I love anything that summer fun campy kind of stuff. Mm -hmm. Uh so if someone was interested or they they knew a family with kids, who is it for? How do they get signed up? All that stuff. So, it's pretty much for kids I would say three years old through maybe like fifth grade. Um, if your kids are younger than that or you have, you know, older and younger, just go for it. It's, I mean, it's, it's, not, it's a really low risk situation. You don't have to pay any money. You don't have to do anything. It's just try it. Um, and if you would like to get in on it, you can search for Summer of Fun at First Grapevine on Facebook or you can just send me an email and I can send you the link. It's probably easier. And your email's on the church website, mm -hmm. so you can just click on your picture. Yeah. yeah. All right. Josh, do you have any tips for keeping older tweens and teenagers occupied, or what are y'all doing this summer? I don't know if they're tips. But they are ideas, and I'll All tell right. you if they're tips after this summer's over, and if they worked really well, I'll call them tips. <laughs> <laughs> for now, um, I'll just say that I have some ideas, and one of the biggest struggles we have at home is technology. And how, 
how, when, and why we use technology. Because they have these little devices, you know, the phones or the tablets or whatever that, um, that have games that they can play, which are fun. And they have uh, internet interactions that they can do, which they find fun, some of it. And some of it, I think, is helpful. And some of it, I've looked at them and said, I, I really believe that if you keep doing that, it will make you dumber. You, know? <laughs> but you don't mince words in the Ingram house. <clears throat> there's no point. There's no point. They're both too too, too smart, smart for their own yeah. good. And, you know, it, trying to hint around and stuff. They're like, Dad, will you just get to it? Um, so I think that we, if we can figure out a way to use that technology in our everyday life that is more beneficial, mm -hmm. okay? And so let me just say, because their camps have been canceled for the summer, VBS is canceled, um, the pools are closed, like all of the things that we would do with our time during the summer, even just to kill a little bit of time, is unavailable. Mm -hmm. So not only is it going to be summer, which is always difficult trying to fill up all the time, mm -hmm. now there's more time and fewer opportunities. So we have to uh, we have to let them know that they're, we know they're going to have to use the, communicate, the, the technology to communicate mm -hmm. uh, with people, and we have to find good ways to do it. One of the things that we started doing was making a, a variety show at home. Oh, that's where, been one of my fa that's that, one of my favorite quarantine activities. Yeah. <laughs> watching the Ingram well, good. Right show. Because the thing is, without this technology, we wouldn't be able to just film something and then broadcast it to whoever wants to watch. Mm -hmm. So, so the technology is a really good thing. But in this thing, we still will sing songs and we'll uh, play games and we'll act out sketches and try to be funny and we'll tell jokes and we'll read stories and things that things that might be beneficial for someone who's looking for a way to kill some time, things that are very beneficial to this dad who needs to take a couple of hours to plan this show with the kids. And so I'm like, ooh, mm -hmm. that knocked out two hours. That was yeah. great. <laughs> um, so there's, you know, there's all of those, there's all those benefits to having the technology, but when they just get on it to do something like playing Minecraft or um, what's the other one they do that uh, – I'll think of it later, or somebody's right now is looking at the TV going, oh, it's this thing. Um, when they do that, I just have to say, all right, set a timer, something. Right. Just like mm -hmm. 30 minutes is good. We'll take a break. We'll do something else. But even when I say, well, let's go outside and, oh, wait, it's like a 1,000 degrees. So yep. hold on. Let's just wait and see what else we can do. So it's just a matter of trying to be intentional and find different ways to use the technology which we have available to us in in a way that's still building their mind. It's still giving them something to uh, grow and, and develop. And then if you have an 11-year-old like mine who really enjoys power tools, then have her help you with the stuff that you need to fix in the <laughs> in the house. Um, she's put in a couple of electrical outlets, and we've made a, a, a charging station uh, for all of our devices that has the cords kind of hidden in it so we can power them up that way overnight and stuff. So there's there's always things to do. You just have to be proactive and try not to let it, wear you down that how much you're having to fill t the time you know yeah we i've realized that um uh, one thing robert was very against at the beginning of quarantine was being bored and i realized like this poor child has not been bored very often he's an only child i mean he has a billion little friends and so he's never really been bored and so he's gotten to understand and now he kind of likes it and he mm -hmm. He starts doing all kinds of cool things and he's making up parties and events for us to attend and with rules and invitations and all kinds of things. And Didn't so, he do disco volleyball? Disco. We've had a lot of discos, oh. a lot of costume yeah, party discos, disco volleyball. Um, so there's either, a common theme. It either involves a costume or disco at, in some form or fashion. But he, we would never have done that before, especially not every night. And so... Yeah, it's been kind of fun to, for me to just be able to tell him, like, you're going to be bored. I'm, I can't play with you every minute. You can't watch TV every minute. Like, you're just going to be bored, and it's going to be great because you're going to – your brain's going to come up with stuff, and it does. And he didn't believe that at first, and now he said he would tell me his brain wasn't working, and now he never says that. So it's okay My to be bored. not working. <laughs> yeah. That's I, and I know one of the other things that you've been uh, – at least you – post on social media a lot about some of the books that you're reading and the books you're reading with 
baby Robert right now. Mm -hmm. Do you want to share a little bit about kind of what you're doing right now? Yeah. So right now, um, obviously there's a lot going on in the world. Um, there's, I mean, too many things to name, but right now we're kind of focusing with baby Robert on, um, racial justice issues, um, kind of the privilege that he has as a five-year-old that he doesn't understand that he has, um, what that looks like for us. Um, and so we've been kind of going through a couple of books, uh, and, and e-workbooks about stuff like that. And that's been interesting. It's been really good for me as it's, interesting for me as a parent to ask him little questions before we read about like, do you know what uh, race is or racism? And he has no idea. Mm -hmm. um, we've, uh, there's a workbook that, or an e-workbook, I guess, that I really recommend. Um, we're gonna, it's gonna be in a book list that we're gonna put out, but. Yeah, wherever you saw, the, if yeah. you're watching this from E! News, it, it's in our e-news, so you should get yes. that. Yeah, and it's it was written and developed by two teachers, their moms, and they ha they have had conversations like this with their kids since they were teen teeny tiny. Because I I as a white mom haven't had to do that, but as black moms they have, and so it's kind of how to start that conversation. They have different guides based on what kind of family dynamic you have, who's in your family, that kind of thing. Um, and it's been really good. We've done some different little games and activities. We've talked a little bit here and there about, it's it's nice to do it in tiny little chunks of just like, this is an idea for you to have in your head. And you know it'll come up later and we'll talk about it when it comes up. So that's been really good for us. It's nice to have kind of extra time for me. Um, it's nice for me to have extra time because I can think through what I'm going to talk about, how much I want to get into, what all exactly we're going to talk about, where I'm going to pause because it's gone far enough for that day, that kind of thing. And, and then it gives me time when he does ask me questions, it gives me time to really think about what is my answer going to be to this question. You know, I have you know, kind of a reflex answer that I can throw out, but is it actually true? Is it actually, you know, a responsible thing to teach my five-year-old? And is it the belief I want him to hold on to as he goes into school and starts interacting with other kids? Um, so that's been something we're diving into. It's a slow process, of course. It's not one conversation and done, but it's going to be a years and years and lifetime of, of little conversations like that. Mm-hmm. And I don't have kids, but I imagine that it that whole the whole topic or topics those probably feel very they're heavy, important things. I imagine it feels kind of daunting. So what what was something that maybe made you nervous about starting those, or maybe you weren't nervous? Um, and this goes for both of you when it comes to having those conversations with your kids, what advice would you give? I like what you said about taking it in little steps. Yeah, I think that for me, the thing that I was worried about and then it did come true, I worry a lot and a lot of the things I worry about don't happen, but this was something I worried about and it did happen. I worried that I wouldn't know and I wouldn't have the right answer to his question and I worried that his question would call something out in me that I didn't want to deal with. That his question, just from a little five-year-old who's learning about all this for the first time, um, has asked me questions about, um, are, mommy, are you a racist? Mommy, do you have white privilege? And, and because I'm talking about them, he wants to know because I'm his mommy. He loves me. I can barely do anything wrong in his eyes. So for him to ask me those questions, for me to have to answer him honestly is hard. And it's it it's not just about talking to my kid so that he grows up with a better cultural, social uh, intelligence that I might not have grown up with, but it's, I have to do that with him, but I also have to do it with me because I can't teach him something that I don't know. And I can't have a good conversation and good answers to his questions if I'm not trying to do it myself. So... To me, that's the most intimidating thing is that, yeah, it does bring up a lot of things about me that I don't love and that I'm working on 
changing and being better. But um, yeah, I think the only real thing you can do about that is just start it. Like you're never going to get anywhere if you don't start. And so just kind of, and not ignoring that, not pushing it aside, but just accepting the fact that you're going to be uncomfortable. You're not going to love every tiny, everything that you have to talk about and every answer you have to give, but being okay with that and accepting that it is what it's going to be. Um, to me, that's the only thing I can do to do it and not just, I don't know, not mess it up, but just kind of like crumble and, yeah. and say, this is too hard. I'm not going to do it. Cause that's the only real mistake I can make is to just decide it's too hard and I'm not going to do it. No, I think that's exactly right. And what you said about being honesty, that, honest, that that is the only place to start a conversation like that with, especially with your children, because it's not that you have to answer the question of racism in the world. You have to answer the question of racism for your own child. And they, what they're asking may not be what you see out in the world or on the news or, or whatever. Um, also, if you've never felt that you judged anyone because of their color or any other reason, then it might not make any sense to you why other people would. And mm -hmm. that is perfectly okay to admit, uh -huh. to say... You know, there's a there's this problem in the world that some people have, and I don't understand why they feel that way, but here's what we're going to try to do to make sure that no one ever feels like they don't have justice, that they don't have love, that they don't have anything that they're supposed to have just because of the color of their skin or, or any other thing that might separate them or divide them from somebody else. And that's what my girls and I talk about. Because I don't think if it wasn't for the media and if it wasn't for some other people that bring it out to them, I don't know if they'd even know that it's a thing that ever existed. You know, right. like they read about slavery at, in, in a history class. Mm -hmm. But even that, they remember when they're when they're taking these classes, they're like, why did they do that? Right. And it's a, that's a long answer, mm -hmm. you know, like why did anyone ever enslave anyone? Why do they still do it in the world? I mean, there's a lot of... There's a lot of complicated answers to that, but if you just answer as honestly as you can and mm -hmm. continue to talk about it, then that's when you can get the truth to be told in your family. Yeah, and I, I agree. I think that, like you were saying, you can't. I can't solve what's going on in the world, but what I have a responsibility to do as a parent, and biblically is the responsibility I have for my child. Like, I am responsible for the well-being of this child, the safety of this child, but the the growth and formation of his spiritual, social, cultural, everything. I of his world view, I'm responsible to 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 kind of mold that and shape that and guide it. And so I think that it is it is um a huge thing that's going on. It's a huge topic in the world and and there's so much sadness and 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 anger and frustration that's built up around it and I can't fix that but I can start having small five ten minute conversations with my kid whenever we have the time when we're sitting in the drive-thru or we're you know waiting for our movie to load or whatever like mm -hmm. you can have them that are so quick and just ask questions to find out where they're at like, have you, when I asked him, have you ever heard of racism? And he said, no. I said, okay. Like, these are questions I have to ask so I know where to start. Mm -hmm. um, because I can't just snap my fingers and in one conversation fix it. But it's a, it's a very slow buildup of, of his worldview through a lot of small conversations in our home. And that's, I, I think that's the most important thing that I can do as a parent is just decide which path our family is going to walk down and do it and not make excuses for it, not apologize for it, not hesitate on it, but just say, we're going to walk down this road. We're going to do these things. We're going to learn about this in a, in a way that's going to make us better citizens of the world and better, and better neighbors to the people around us. And, and then just like hit it hard and run after it and not, and not stop. Mm -hmm. I think and this isn't a conversation that we we can solve, quote unquote. And this isn't, it's a conversation that the three of us can't have. If you look at us, there's a lot that we can't understand. Mm -hmm. And so if you're watching this, this you've heard from Travis, you 
um, have heard a little bit from our church. Um, but we also just mentioned this today to know that this is something that we're in for the long haul. This is something that um, we're talking, we're having conversations about. Josh is going to make fun of me for saying having conversations about. Uh, but trying to figure out what do we do, not just now in the media, but how do we, uh, how do we become devoted disciples of Jesus Christ who are committed to issues of justice? And so uh, check out the book list that we're, we're putting out a book list for all ages. That's a great place to start. If the information you see online about how to take those next steps as a Christian, if that's overwhelming, contact Monica, contact me, contact someone on staff, and we'll help you find the resource that's right for you. Um, we're going to be doing, a, we're, go, we're going to be having more of these conversations. So just know, we know the conversation's not finished. Um, and to be in prayer for some, be in prayer, asking God what you can do. What's your next mm -hmm. step? We want to uh, remind you that uh, starting on June 9th at 5 o'clock, I'll be leading uh, a Bible study to go along with our sermon series of Jonah in June. Um, I uh, will help us go a little bit deeper into the scripture uh, for the weeks uh, and try to uncover uh, some gems that are there for us to plumb and mine uh, related to... Um, more in-depth look at what uh, God is saying to us through this powerful, uh, powerful story. Uh, what a great story for our time. And so I, I really want to encourage you to join me. Uh, I look forward uh, to leading and to sharing and to being with you in that sacred time together. Uh, Tuesday, 5 o'clock, beginning on June 9th and running through the month of June. Thank you. I do want to ask what y'all think about Jonah. We just started this new series called Jonah and June because I like alliterations and Jonah and June both start with J uh, or I'm not creative, one of the two. <laughs> but it's a story, it's very short. Judy Brown called me uh, today and she said, I've already read it all because it's only four chapters long. It's about two pages in your Bible. Uh, one, if it aligns just perfectly. But what do y'all think? What's What sticks out to you just as a whole about Jonah? Since it is a story that's often used in children's ministry, I'll let you go first. Oh, thank you. Um, I, think, I think there's so many ways you can look at Jonah because I think Jonah just goes through such a range of regular human emotions in one situation like he has this one situation God says go do this thing because these people need me and they need you and through that he goes through I mean he he goes through a denial he's like I'm not gonna go there he listens to too much to the people around him he lets himself be influenced by outside voices and I mean he is and then he gets swallowed by a whale and he gets to feel sorry for himself a little bit and and you know he he just goes through all this and then he finally kind of comes out doing what he was asked to do in the first place and I appreciate the story because I think it's so so much of what we do like if I could just hear what God wants me to do and do it, I don't know if I've ever done it. I don't know if I've ever not made 16 stops in the middle or asked five other people, what do you think I should do? And I mean, all of that kind of stuff. And so for me to see that in Jonah and to see that in this story, it, I don't know, it's just kind of comforting that like, I'm not, a, I'm not the only one. I'm not like falling behind. I'm at the bottom of the pack. Like this is what humans do. Like humans don't get it right on the first try. We just, we just don't. And, and it's, and it's nice for me to know that like, I'm just because I don't do it right the first time, I'm not just done for. Like mm -hmm. God hasn't just decided, okay, she's never going to do anything right because she didn't do this right. That's not the case. And I, I think that's important to talk to kids about and say like, you're not going to get it right all the time. And you're not just 
you know, we're not going to like write you off because you didn't do it correctly. Like we're going to work with you and we're going to show you what's happened. Just like God kind of does with Jonah. So I think you can look at it from a lot of different perspectives, but I feel like to me, the big, the best lesson for me is like, you just keep going with the next thing that God asks you to do. Like, even if you screwed it up the last time, you just keep Those going. small steps, small like steps. you're saying. Yeah. Yeah. Well, I, when I was asking around to people when we were doing Jonah, I was just trying to get my heart and mind ready for it. And so I'd ask people, random people, you know, not just at church, but wherever I saw them, mm-hmm. hey, man, what do you know about Jonah? And a lot of times, Jonah from the Bible. Yes, Jonah from the Bible. And you'd be like, that, isn't that the dude that got eaten by a fish? And across the board, this was the answer. Mm-hmm. And if I said, what else? They're like, they got eaten by a fish because he did something wrong. That's about it. Yeah, like, yeah. That's and and it's just funny the way uh, the the biblical stories can sort of be in our culture, but not mm-hmm. not all of it, right? Yeah. And I think sometimes that colors the image of God in people's minds when they know just a part of the story. Like, mm. hey, God, he was wrong, so he got punished because he got eaten, eaten by a fish. And yeah. and I think that that could definitely, if that was all you knew, then it, it would definitely paint a Maybe a strange image of God in your mind. Yeah. When I was working with youth over the years, I would often use the story of Jonah because it it has so much to do with choice, right? And 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 I and I love the part where they go, "Who ticked off God? Was it you? No, what me? Was it you? No, it was me." And they uh, cast he's lots. Like, he's like, ah, uh, "Okay, it, it was me. It was me." And they're like, "Oh, awesome! Here's the solution." In you go. You <laughs> Jonah know? kind of volunteers. Well, right. Too. That's what yeah. I'm saying. Like, there you go. That's kind of because uh, that we wouldn't solve a problem like that nowadays. Yeah. So that's kind of the fun of the um, of the Bible. And then, yeah, God sends a fish, takes him right to where he was supposed to be. He gets vomited up, which is a fun image, mm-hmm. vomited up on the beach. And then he goes into Nineveh and then he preaches and then exactly what God wanted to happen happens. And then... Later on, there's stuff where he throws more fits. and stuff. I mean, Jonah just seems to <laughs> yeah. be very much like a lot of the teenagers I was working with. And if I'm being real honest with myself, a lot like me who wants things to be a certain way. And then when I'm called to do them differently in a way that's uncomfortable to me, I am unlikely to first say, sure. Mm-hmm. And there are personal times in my life where I could compare to being in the belly of a whale because... I didn't listen when God led me the first time. Mm -hmm. And I think most of us, even even if we're trying to be completely 100% faithful to God, I think most of us can realize that there are times when following the call, whether whether intentionally or not, can be a challenge. And so Mm -hmm. I think it's important that we continue to refer back to Jonah and remember if it happened to him, there's probably a reason that it's included in this story and what are we supposed to learn from it and I think what we're supposed to learn from it is just like what you said. Following is difficult. And when we don't follow, God can help get us back on track, even though it might be a little challenging, mm-hmm. where we'll always have a choice again. We'll have the chance to say, okay, this time I'll do it. Mm-hmm. And I think kind of what you were talking about with people know a little bit of the story, but not all of it. The way that Jonah's written, it's not like, and Jonah was swallowed by a whale because God thought he deserved another chance. It doesn't say that. Uh, it says God provided a fish to swallow Jonah. Mm-hmm. And so we we have to, we first we have to learn it. We have to know the story. And so a lot of us learn it as kids. It's dramatic. It's fun. Mm-hmm. And then the meaning comes later and we have to fill in the gaps later. And I think for a long time I wrestled with the story of Jonah because I couldn't figure out why. Why is this happening? What's going on? Uh, and it takes, and I think in different times in my life, different parts have stuck out to me. And I've felt that there were, I've read in between the lines differently, which I think is the beauty of the Bible. Yeah. I think I love that you were talking about uh, asking random people, what do you know about Jonah? And you're right. Like, I think a lot of us, and we probably do this wrong when we teach it to kids, it's we get, we hold on to this idea that God sent a whale to swallow Jonah because he was mad or because Jonah did something wrong. But like that 
whale fish was a gift. Like God provided a, a, an incredible mercy to Jonah by sending this fish and not allowing him to just drown. You know, he sends him and he gives him this gift of safety and this gift of time to, to have, to sit and think about what he was doing with his life and to think about, you know, where am I going? What am I doing? Who am I listening to? What's more important? Um, and he's able to, in this whale, prioritize and and realign what he was doing with what he knew he should do. Mm -hmm. um, and so to me, it's like, it does, we do kind of give the fish this reputation of being this, you know, this tool that God uses out of anger, but it's really a, a tool that he uses out of mercy to mm -hmm. say, I'm going to give you another chance. I'm not going to let you die and drown in the ocean. I'm going to, I'm going to let you realize what, what you need to do and do it. And then he, and then when, as soon as Jonah says, you're right, I changed my mind. I know that this is what I need to do. There you are. Let me deliver you right to where you need to be safe and sound. Yes, probably, grossed out but like you're where you need to be because of that gift so mm -hmm. yeah I think that that's that's a cool thing about Jonah I pastor Travis has been talking about well he has a bible study that he's leading this month for anyone interested and on Tuesdays and the title is the amazing it's something about the amazing grace of Jonah it's got amazing grace and Jonah in the title <laughs> But it's interesting to think about it from that perspective because we usually do think about it. He did something wrong and he got sold by a fish. So I want to ask one question kind of before we go. Uh, this week we're preaching on chapter two. That's what our server, that's kind of what our conversations and messages are centering around, which is um, for most of that chapter, Jonah is in the belly of the whale. So if you can imagine, uh, what would be the worst or the weirdest part about being stuck in the belly of a whale? I think that the smell and the climate would be initially uh, what I would not like. And then for the three days, I think you get over that. For the three days, I think you go from fear to loneliness to just complete depression because you're probably feeling like this is it for you. Mm -hmm. So that's what I think. Yeah. I think for sure the smell at first, and it's just, it's like a shock to your senses, to Jonah's senses that he went from living his life normally to disobeying God, to hiding out to, it's this whole progression of, you know, he kind of just makes one wrong choice after another. And so I think, yeah, I think that just having that that kind of shock of going from a lot of outside influences to none um, and being basically solitary in this place and just, I don't know, I think going from, Jonah's the kind of person who, He's listening to everyone around him. Even mm -hmm. when God directly tells him to do something, he's still listening to what he, the words he grew up with that people from Nineveh are terrible and it's a scary place and you never want to go there and all of that kind of stuff. So I think that it's just that, that culture shock of when you're forced to be quiet and you're forced to, you know, not be bombarded with all kinds of outside influences that it can be kind of shocking. And like you're saying, it can be depressing and, and lonely. And then he comes up at the end and he says like, I'll give you a sacrifice with a voice of thanks because his whole perspective changes. So I think that to me, I think that would be the weirdest thing going from living life with nothing but outside influences to living with none and what you have to do when that happens. I love those answers. I was just going to say the seaweed, like, wrapping around my legs or something, but those are actually thoughtful answers. <laughs> um, <laughs> thanks for sharing. Do y'all have anything else that you want to share before we let people go back to their daily lives? Uh, I just want to say thanks to everybody for continuing to watch and be faithful uh, with your your time and your energy and, and your resources to help support the church and the church's mission. 
because that hasn't changed, mm -hmm. even though the, what Jesus said when he gave us the Great Commission is still as much of, a, of an importance as it, now as it was when we could all gather together on Sunday morning and get, get recharged and refueled and, and feel the fellowship. Um, and we can't do that right now, and it's really hard to keep this thing going without the support of the congregation. And I want to thank our pastors and our staff mm -hmm. for continuing to be dedicated to finding new and, and appropriate and powerful ways to reach to a group of people that we can't gather and, and be around each other for. And I really thank the tech crew for all the work they've been doing and the hours that they put in to be able to to uh, allow the church to reach out and, and still connect with people in these times. So thank you, all of those people. And if you're watching at home, there, send a lot, a lot, a lot of helpful and thankful emails to the pastors and to the media team. Thanks. I agree. <laughs> well, thank you all for joining us today. And uh, know that we're here for you. If there's something that you that we talked about or something we didn't talk about that you want to have a conversation about, this is just the beginning of conversations. Uh, and we're in prayer for you, and we can't wait to see you soon. Thanks. For current information about the effects of COVID-19 precautions at First Grapevine Church, visit firstgrapevine.org slash COVID-19 updates.